So next up, between com global compliance and custom com customer convenience, KYC in a changing world, um, I'd like to introduce Peter Murray uh, to the stage from Alexum Services. I've known Peter for, for many years, and um, if there's something around KYC that that's, uh, he doesn't know, then it's probably not worth knowing. So um, he's an he's a expert in this space, and, uh, and it should be a really good talk. So Peter, over to you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's always good to come to an event on a second day where the crowd is almost the same size as the first day, and I think that probably says something about the quality of the event. Um, I hope we're sharing those slides, because I love that stuff that Edgar's just gone through, because it, for me, it reflects two things. It reflects uh, the markets and perceptions are pretty similar wherever you go. There's, there's nuances. But the other thing it highlights and, and rams home for me is the need for effective regulation. Uh, the need to get it right, uh, because the consequences of ineffective regulation are, are, are pretty steep. Um, and when, <laughs> thanks to Willem and the team for inviting me to talk around KYC, but I have to say when we, we promoted this a couple of months ago, I was hoping to sit here and give you some pretty specific examples of how identity is going to help uh, in the Dutch regulated market. Uh, but as with the rest of you who were here yesterday, we didn't quite get the clarification uh, we were looking for. Um, it was great to get the dates, uh, and they are tight, um, but I think we all came away uh, needing more clarity. Having said that, uh, the point of uh, KYC uh, and truly knowing someone's identity uh, is important irrespective of what the regulation is going to say. It is your Im most important and valuable asset is truly knowing what that customer, uh, customer is and who we do is what they do. And so what I do, I spent 10 years working for one of the big um, global identity providers before realizing that the world was changing and no one company is going to be able to provide the solutions and the answers uh, that everybody needs. Um, so what I do now is I deal with operators, uh, regulators, industry stakeholders, just advising on what technology is out there. I don't sell this stuff, it's more around what it can do, uh, and just as importantly, where the gaps are. So if you're looking at facial recognition, for example, or AI, there's benefits, um, but there's also gaps that are there. So that's me, but what I thought I'd do, providing this is working, is just give an example of, of, of we are now living in a time where the, the services provided from a KYC perspective was set up 10, 15, 20 years ago. And the industry is moving at such a fast pace, e-commerce is moving at such a speed, yet the processes we have sat behind that haven't changed at all. So we're in a position whereby uh, we are gonna soon be in an environment where uh, you can insure your home without keying any data. They'll take your location, we'll take the data that's already provided within that, uh, and provide you some uh, a basic quote straight away. Uh, that's that one. Uh, you're going to get a mortgage by using a selfie and a document image. And these things are starting to be trialed and implemented elsewhere. And one of my own personal favorite, because this is out there now, which is if the old days of queuing up, waiting to have all your documents taken, uh, and then having to get to somewhere to get your car, uh, they're going to go. That car will be delivered to you, uh, and that authentication, verification, will be very powerful, and it will be in the hands of the, the, the smartphone and the device that you'd lose. And then finally, uh, you're going to be able to rent a home based on your trust. Uh, and I think trust, trust rating, and I think this is important stuff, because uh, it is going to be around trust and sustainability. Um, but if you're able to recognize and be recognized by others as providing a good service, these things are starting to be uh, made available now. Where is that going? Yeah, that's better. So what's the common thread with all of that? Well, it, it, you know, pretty s simple stuff. Uh, it's around the whole access of data, the whole breadth and wealth of data that's out there. But the challenge for us all is, is numerous, but it, trying to see the wood for the trees, what does it mean? The ability to have that information on me, does it actually tangibly benefit you or me? Um, and that common thread, if I can get the technology working. Let's just do it this way, old school. Oh. Okay, get there. Access to identity uh, and data. 
So what are you going to use? Where's it getting from? What does it mean? And I've got some visual representations of this in, in a second. Uh, but the key thing is at those points there, it is going to be around. Now, people talk a lot about the privacy and the issues that have come up around um, Facebook and data analytica. But there is a willingness, um, certainly from the millennials, and it was fascinating, Owen's view earlier, of it's a, the millennials is a state of mind, it's an attitude rather than just a simple age group because the next generation of customers are willing to take, uh, to invest in this, to share their data if it's both willingly shared fully verified and more importantly responsibly used uh, we see that in all the uh, conversations we have there you go thank you uh, with, with certainly with the millennial age group whereby if as, as long as they see the benefit of what they're getting and the data is to, um, uh, protected then they're willing to share this and quite frankly my kids growing up at 10 and 12 they don't care they'll share anything at this point um, but so it is the attitude that's changing and that's the challenge we've got. The challenge we have as uh, regulators, and I speak a lot with regulators, is balancing that whole customer experience uh, with global compliance. Uh, that, that sort of tsunami of information, that, that battle between GDPR trying to protect your data uh, and AML regulation trying to get more of it to verify who you are. Um, and it, that's, that's not going anywhere. That's just a conversation we have to have. Uh, but it is around customer experience. Your next generation of customers want convenience. They want a great customer experience, user experience. So what, what does traditional t KYC look like? What's sustained our industry, whether it be online or offline, for the last 10, 15 years? It's pretty basic stuff. Uh, it could be a document, a government source data, but it pretty much boils down to giving somebody your name, your address, uh, and your date of birth. So, okay, you might say that's fine, but does it tell you anything other than that, that person actually exists? And certainly in countries where operators might be looking to grow, you simply don't have this kind of data. If you were looking, say, to Africa to, uh, to build out your product offering, then they don't have a traditional uh, legacy history of, of bricks and mortar banking, anything like that. The power of the future of those markets is all going to be sat in your mobile phone. But if that's what it is, uh, and then there's also the challenges of, uh, of whether that data is being put in correctly, the, the typos that might come in from the customer or your staff, there's a load of challenges around fraud. But you know what? We haven't changed that particular model in, in 10, 15 years. What does ID look like now? Well, I think for, for me, it breaks down into sort of three or four parts. Um, that information you see on the left about attributed data, so the stuff we've just gone through on the last slide, it's your name, it's your address, government-issued data around passport, social security, the basic details you might take of somebody. But that was all the old physical way. You would physically hand a document in or meet somebody um, or put that online. Um, and then the digital process, which is your device ID, your social ID, the cookies that are in there are all things that you know, we've known of being out there. What, what's the interesting stuff it is, uh, and that's what we need to address the changing face of identity, is around the biometrics and the behavioral. So this is stuff that's unique to you. And who would have thought we'd be able to our, access our bank accounts just by using our thumbs? Um, so it's fingerprints, it's retina, it's facial recognition. And I've done some work with casinos uh, on facial recognition, and there's some interesting things come out of all of this because these products and services aren't the finished article, but they are the way forward. And there's was, there was two things around the, uh, the facial recognitions in the casino, and one was around lighting and the camera quality, because they're not obviously well lit. Um, the other one is simply getting somebody to look up. If you're walking any day, anywhere nowadays, you tend to be looking down at your phone. You walk into a casino, the camera's there, it's simply not gonna pick you up. So there's, there's lessons to be learned in all of this, but these are systems that are, are coming, and that facial recognition as part of a process is really interesting stuff, although it has its problems. You know, I was a typical white, uh, you know, middle-aged guy. I'm going to be picked up by these things, but if you're not white and you're not male, the, the pass rate drops significantly. And I like the, the, the voice recognition, because I think this is uh, where it's going. We are not that far from being able to just get your smart device and go, Alexa, 
What's the odds on England giving Holland a good thumping tonight in the football? Three, four nil. That's going to start providing that kind of information to you. So this stuff might seem far-fetched, but it's out there and it's starting to have an impact on what we do now uh, and operators are looking at that. And so when you spend time with regulators workshopping what these things are, they have to have a view on this because this is the next generation uh, of KYC. I firmly believe, by the way, that uh, documents are going to be a thing of the past. I think the, the showing, I mean, we all know what the pass rates are like or how they drop off when you start asking people for documents. Uh, and they are part of the process, but I firmly believe, and I'll cover this in a second, where identity will end up is what you will be verified once and you'll use that many times. So that's some of the, 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 the uh, techniques and, and uh, products that are out there at the moment. And there's also information, obviously, we don't uh, um, readily give, and that's things like the PEPs and sanctions lists, and I'll cover those in a minute. Source of wealth, the, the big one, the, the, the holy grail if you could get it, but it's simply not out there at the moment. And then there's the challenges around self-exclusion, and I've, I've, I've dealt with a couple of self-exclusion projects, you know, whether it was the UK one, which was a whole interesting thing, because you're trying to deliver identity in a country that simply will not accept a single ID, a, a government ID card. So there's their, the biggest challenges they had and the reason they got themselves all over the, the front page and on the, the BBC News was it's pretty difficult uh, to do a, a, an identity for a self-exclusion. But it was interesting to hear yesterday from uh, the regulator about what they're going to do here. We didn't, again, we didn't get the detail we needed. Um, but the self-exclusion projects are a starting point in newly regulated markets, whereas if it's the UK, you're sort of trying to deliver something after... 15, 20 years where everybody's data is uh, taken differently, consumed differently. And you're trying to deliver something by aligning that up. And that's one of the lessons. And the regulator has a lot of responsibility on this, on how that looks like. So how did we get there? So just as a recap, as traditional KYC is your name, it's your address, it's your date of birth, it's the time stamped, deliverable data, and it's static. It doesn't give you any updates. And I, I remember one of the big Companies, when they uh, floated a few years ago, they had a database of 7 million people. A vast majority of them had only been touched once. It had been, that's when they onboarded them. That's what the challenge was. It wasn't about updating that uh, information. But what identity is going to look like, and new style KYC, is all the stuff. But those bottom two points there is, is about dynamic, it's evolving, and critically, it's going to be real time. If you're trying to engage with me and fully understand me, whether it's just to deliver a better experience or whether it's to deliver me a message around responsible gambling and harm minimization, then it's got to be done in real time. You've got to be taking the combination of the data that the suppliers and your vendors will have with the data that the operator or the casino will have. So what's traditional see Just as a visual representation of what the old style, it's not, it's about, you know, I'm no Brad Pitt, so, but that's the best photograph I could get, but that's where I live. Uh, you find me, I'm a typical guy, I've got a bank account with Lloyds, I'm on every of the available uh, data sources that are out there from the big credit rating agencies. Uh, I've got a passport and I pay my taxes, honest, I do. But if you want to know a bit more about me to deliver that experience and to make sure I'm protected, um, then this is what identity looks like now. So if you want to, um, you could go to any of the standard databases that are out there, and this one's given up on me as well. There you go. So I'm on your typical social media. So I'm on your Facebook, I'm on your Twitter account, I'm on your Instagram. I, I'm promiscuous with my shopping. I shop at Sainsbury's and Mercadona in Spain, which is where I live now. I've got three or four, as typical, three or four online uh, gambling accounts. Um, and it's interesting when you're trying to look at this, because your natural perception is that you can't trust Facebook. You know, these things aren't authenticated when you go on them. They say they're 13 and they're not. But you know what? If I've got a Facebook account that I've been using regularly for seven years, that's got to have some sort of layer of value you can add in that to truly know your customers. And there are co companies out there that are selling that as a solution. Uh, and, you know, that sort of data, qualified and over a period of time, does have some real value around that. And that's when you get a proper picture of me, which is when I was sailing somewhere around the world on a boat in Vietnam. But that gives you a much better picture of, of me as an individual if you're trying to engage with me. So whether it's the marketing aspect or the regulatory concentration on problem gambling, you need to be layering in quite a lot of this stuff. And it's quite simple. 
whatever you might think of it, KYC is no longer good enough. And that's not just me. I've picked out some quotes from the UK Gambling Commission, which um, apart from dishing out fairly substantial fines at the moment, um, you know, I'm not saying they're perfect by any stretch of imagination, but they are starting to focus the minds, and fines do focus minds. So I've picked out four um, quotes that they gave over the last 18 months, um, which will be... Okay, that's the first one. So data which underpins everything we do, and that is what we do. Uh, we have to gather and use better quality data. Gone are the days, and when I was in that space, if somebody going, I can get a cheaper understanding, just find me once on a database. Get them on board, sell them my products, let's make some money. That day has gone. And I think it's driven by player protection, harm minimization, but you can no longer just take uh, a cheap and cheerful way of trying to identify me. The Commission expects, and this is a key one I wanted to pick up with the regulator yesterday, but it's about cooperation. Now, this, in this instance, is about harm minimization, um, but we're an industry that almost, by default, refuses to engage with each other, whether it's two operators. There was a, there was a time not so long ago where if operator A said to operator B, that's a problem gambler, operator B, well, that's a VIP, we need to be all over it. There was simply a lack of trust, and if there's a lack of trust internally, then we can't complain with what the rest of the world thinks of the gambling sector. So I would, I would uh, implore all of you guys to, and I've seen that out there at the moment, that more people talk to each other. So I'll take self -ex um, problem gambling solutions. Four or five companies doing some great work around that, you know, what, but they're not talking to each other. You know, how, you know they, they see that as a differentiation. Well, this is about sustaining the industry and making sure uh, you know, we're all around uh, in this in a few years' time. Um, how they're making greater use of data and technology and some of the, the sort of sources I showed you earlier on. So what are you doing? Are, are you really using best of breed? Have you tried everything? Can you demonstrate that you've done everything you can to help that? And that might be facial recognition in betting shops. Um, it might be just different sources of data from an affordability, which is the key sort of area that the UK is looking at. Can I afford to gamble? Uh, and finally, um, Keeping it up to date is probably the most critical thing at the moment, because if you verified me on that account or in that casino three years ago, I've changed. You know, my circumstances have changed. Uh, everything about what I do is different. You have to keep that data up to date. And I've, I've just put a couple of examples on here, and there's a huge plethora of, of businesses that are out there, but you've got the big data aggregators, so GBG, who I used to work for, Experian, Equifax, don't mention data breaches. Um, but there's a lot of data out there you can take. There's then some really interesting and powerful stuff around uh, PEPs, sanctions, a for, um, source of wealth, so the Dow Joneses, the Accuracy's Comply Advantage. Uh, and then there's the guys that are trying to disrupt the space. Now, we, if you're in it, you probably know of device ID from iAvation. But there are some disruptors in there, like ID Now. Uh, some really interesting stuff from companies like Onfido, an American-backed sort of uh, document facial recognition. And then Yorty, which is doing some really interesting stuff around a federated identity that I'll, I'll come to in a second. And GeoComply are the US version of, of geolocation. So in the US, it's a big, um, they, they confuse where you are with who you are, but it still has some value as where are you when you're placing that bet. Uh, there's some big platforms out there, so there's a couple of names on there, including uh, LeaseWeb, the hosting guys who are here today. Um, but they're starting to recognize that there's this whole wealth of data out there. And you've and then there's the blocking technology. So Gamban's a, a big name at the moment in the UK. Uh, you've got Game Secure, which is the American version of that. So you're using your phone, and an app is there to protect you by blocking access to that. Monzo Bank, then followed by some of the big banks, have also done the same sort of thing. So this, again, this is around harm minimization. And then you've got, you know, here in Holland, you've got a company that's starting to pull all of that together. There's other people out there, but that ability, as the market contracts and the mergers and acquisitions happen, they want less suppliers, not more. You don't want to have to integrate 40, 50 different solutions when you might be able to consume that through uh, one particular aggregator and pass that on from there. So, um, and that's what that looks like. That's just a typical platform. They use it in uh, financial services, uh, whereby all that data comes in and you control the rules. So what the stuff I've just gone on about 
sits in that middle section of your, your scorecards, all your data, all that comes together. And there's clearly companies out there and starting to evolve in that space, which says, let me take all of that and we'll build a bespoke solution for you. And that doesn't matter whether you're online or land-based. And then one of my favorite bits when I'm talking around regulators, there's a, there's a big responsibility and, and it, it's great to be here because the emerging markets or the ones that are about to regulate um, should be in a better position, should be in a, a position to lead the way. But they have to embrace the technologies that's out there. They have to understand. The, the time I spent in the US was dealing with people who didn't understand the internet, never mind what they were trying to regulate. So you have to embrace that and understand because badly regu regulated is almost as bad as not having any. Um, you need to um, support safe and secure data sharing, and, and, and it's a big thing I tend to go on about. This industry does not share data. It's starting to, driven by self-exclusion, whether that be the Australians, the, the Danes, the UK, uh, and you've got uh, the Crooks system here. Uh, but start sharing that data for the benefit of the industry, not just for fraud, do it for player protection, do it for understanding the sector. Uh, and then finally, around that uh, uh, protection of data, so that whole GDPR. And the UK Commission, when GDPR came in, was just simply saying, you can't use GDPR of, uh, as a way of not doing the KYC properly. So whether it's terms and conditions, whether it's how you deliver that, you can't use GDPR as not knowing who your customer is. And so the battleground is over four points. It's the friction of the new customers coming in against the user experience, what's regulation going to do. Um, against your customer preferences, that big GDPR wanting less information available, to AML, KYC wanting more, uh, and then there's around that security and flexibility of the systems you've got. So just a couple of slides left. The sharing economy is a, 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 a big thing for me, and that's the way um, the data-driven uh, uh, experience is going to be. But for us as a sector, that's sharing stories between each other, sharing technology trying to get something that works. If you're two suppliers and vendors into the industry, then start talking to each other. Because if we're still in our silos two or three years down the line, we won't have got any further forward. Uh, and it's critical that the, the regulator buys into this as well. And if you're asking us where we're going to be in a few years' time, uh, it's, it's called the me to be society, federated identity, self-sovereign identity. The power of the, the, the data will all be held in your smart device, generally your phone. Everything else is in there. Um, but it's going to be that you will be verified once and use many. What will happen is you'll have different levels of authentication within that. And the governments are trying to see that in Australia, are trying to reduce ID. The UK had something called uh, GovVerify. Wasn't a spectacular success, but governments trying to implement this kind of stuff never are. But the fact is that's where it's going. You will have your authentication. I will deliver. Uh, without giving any information, a level of security that will enable me to have my shopping delivered, uh, a different level of security with the same data that will allow me to get uh, my home insured, and then you know, the full authentication will be for government services and areas like gambling. Um, and that's where we were at. Now, that's what, five years off, but don't think it's not coming because it is, and we're starting to see that in other jurisdictions that don't have that legacy of data and technology and banking systems that we do. So if you go to the likes of Kenya and parts of Africa and parts of Latin America, you know, they don't have a standard address. Everything's held in your phone. It'll be able to locate you, verify you, and we can use that to deliver a great customer experience by truly knowing who our customers are. And what does that mean for, the, for, for here in the Netherlands? And I was hoping to give you some specific examples before the lack of clarity came yesterday. But I think that the phrase he used was, be the best of yourselves. Now, you can take that whichever way you want, but that is just do the right thing. You can start implementing this kind of technology and solutions because you know it's coming. Yeah? Whatever regulation says, your most valuable asset is that person at the other end of the online experience or that person that's coming into the casinos. So start using and exploring and understanding the technology that's out there and what it truly means to know your customer. Um, that's it. It's a whiz-bang tour of, of, of what's out there. I'll happily share some stuff once the regulator confirms how they're going to do that. So are the PSPs going to get involved? Do you do what the UK does and just take as much data as possible? Um, but if you've got any questions around it, or I, you know, I'm quite happy to give advice on what is out there and the gaps and the good points. Um, but from a, a perspective of, of knowing your customer, uh, that's a whiz-bang tour of what the landscape's like at the moment. Any questions?
Every, everybody's scared of the facial technology and the voice recognition, I think. That would be privacy's an issue. No? And um, the potential of facial recognition in a betting shop or indeed yep. any kind of land-based operation, where, is, is that a, a possibility as a, as a solution for self-exclusion schemes that need to be across online and land-based slash yeah. retail? And, and if, if, it, if it's not, then where do you see that going and, and what, what could the solutions look like? Uh, no, I think it's definitely part of it. I know one of the big, uh, if, if you're not aware, the, the, the betting shops in the UK, there's 8,000 of them, four companies own the vast majority of those. Uh, and a couple of those are trialling facial recognition. So when I, I worked with, it was NEC at the time, the big Japanese conglomerate who deliver cities, systems, Champions League finals, there were some challenges around that. But there's no, I think I covered it. There's no one solution. Facial recognition or that ability to be verified and then make sure that it's you, that's part of the facial recognition thing. So you, you'll, you'll see the technology out there whereby you're starting to move your head and talk, and, and that will verify that it, 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 it's a you and it matches a document. But I think we're specifically around self-exclusion, then yeah, yes, it does, because you know, people think it's about, you've got, you've got to be able, the key thing from the UK is about making sure that it's that person that's self-excluded. Yeah? And, and it's so important for our industry that we get this right, which was interesting yesterday from some of the comments around crooks. But it is critical that we get it right, because we have a trust issue and a reputational issue in, our, uh, in the industry we work in. Um, but yes, it'll be part of the process, and, and I think increasingly it's going to be quite um, a, a high profile and an important part of that. Any other questions from the audience? You're going to get bored of hearing my voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's, lunch, it's lunchtime. <laughs> okay, brilliant. We, we finished a, a little bit early, so um, thank you, Peter. Thank you for explaining all that in a way that even I can understand. That was, um, that was fantastic. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you.